We are now being recorded. This is the start of our program portion of the meeting of May 25th, 2021 of the Creston Valley Rotary Club. And this morning, uh, I would like to turn the program over to our 2020 Citizen of the Year and our club member, Johnny Huscroft. And he's gonna talk about aviation in Creston, the Golden Centenaires, our connections to the Snowbirds and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, so Johnny, if you could unmute yourself, I would just let you know, Johnny, that I can at any time uh, show on my screen your complete Centenaires uh, brochure. So if you want me to refer to that, let me know and I will go there. So Johnny, unmute yourself and introduce your guest and present your program. Thank you. You need to touch the little red button, John, somewhere. As you can tell, this is well rehearsed. There should be a little microphone in red, John. Oops, that's your one that killed your picture. There's one beside it that should be your microphone. The joys of Zoom. You are still on mute, John. There's something on your screen that you need to touch that unmutes yourself. You were talking earlier and then you must have touched this. Mute buttons at the bottom left. Here we go. That unmute me. Johnny, you are loud and clear and we see uh, you are front and center. Uh, again, our program today, John Huscroft. Hi guys. I wanted to talk today about Clarence Lang. I know him as Clarence and his accomplishments. <clears throat> and I have a special guest here today, John Swallow. John's 82 years old. He's still flying. He's actually teaching people to fly formation, I'm told. And he was Clarence's wingman, left wing in the Centenaires. He's going to speak to us, but I'll say a few things about Clarence that I knew in Lister back in the 50s. And I hope you guys read the brochure and then you can, John will say a few words and you can ask him questions because he's the one that has the answers. <laughs> Good morning, John. Clarence was born, or not born, but he was born in 1937, but they moved to Lister in 1949. Lister in the 50s was definitely off the grid. It was a very rural, gravel roads, outhouses, no electricity, one phone at the store, two room schoolhouse, grade one to grade six with two teachers, the big room and the small room. I talked to Clarence's sister, Anita, the other day, and she told me the first few years they were here, they lived in a two bedroom, basically a cabin, and she and Clarence used to go up a ladder outside into the attic and sleep on each side of the chimney from the wood stove to keep warm. You know, very different than we have today. Out in Lister in those days in the 50s, it was a close community. Most of the young people from time to time worked at the family sawmill, the Huscroft sawmill, in the summer usually. And Clarence was one of them. And a couple of summers in the after he graduated in 1955 he was working in the mill and my father Kenneth asked him what he was going to do and he said what do you mean I've got a good life good job I'm happy dad said yeah but the job ends in September so there was Clarence and another fellow named Dick Milner that were the same age Lister guys and they'd been hanging out with dad for quite a while Clarence was eight years older than I am and dad was 20 years older anyway they decided they were going to join the army. So dad being ex-Air Force 
said he'd give him an airplane ride. He didn't have a plane then, but he went to Cranbrook and rented a tripacer and took him for a ride. Nick got sick and he joined the army. But Clarence loved it, so he joined the Air Force. Within a couple of years, he was flying fighters in Europe. In 1962, he was chosen to fly the slot position in the Golden Hawk Sabre team, which he did till 1964. And 1966, I believe at that time he was 29 years old and a squadron leader, probably one of the youngest in the Air Force. He was asked to lead the Golden Centenary Centennial Demonstration Team, which he did, and they were very successful. They flew 121 shows and I believe 184 days, which will never be beaten. It's an amazing number of shows. Uh, they were recognized by their peers as the best in the world. And the legacy of the Golden Centenaries is the Snowbirds, which carried on a couple of years later with the still flying tutors today. Anyway, that's what I know when I knew Clarence very well. Of course, when he retired and came back to Crest and he started the dairy with his brother Alvin. And uh, just two or three years, he got cancer and the poor guy passed away when he was only 47. He was a really humble guy. He was more interested in farming when you talk to him just about anything else. And uh, the Harris uh, Alpine Cheese Place is the original dairy that he and Alvin started. And Wayne Harris is his nephew, just as a point of interest. Anyway, any questions you want to ask about that? And then I'd ask John Swallow to say a few words, and he's the man you should ask the questions. John, would you like me to just go through the brochure and some of those photos, and maybe you and John could comment on those photos? Would, would that be a good start? Certainly. Uh, It'll work for okay. me. Okay, I will I will go through the brochure page by page, and if, if John or uh, John Johnny or John, if either one of you just ask me, I can move to the next slide. So I will share my screen with that brochure and you'll still be able to be heard. And, uh, but you can comment on those pictures because I, I think pictures uh, for us are, uh, are always helpful. Yeah. From look, the looks of the gray hair here, most of you remember the Golden Hawks. They were disbanded in 1984 due to monetary reasons. And it was a, what a short two years later that the, the, the uh, it was decided to stand up another aerobatic team. From that CV, as I knew him, of course, uh, was picked to lead them. And uh, because of the shortness of the, uh, of the uh, time that they had to, to bring the airplane into fruition, it was, and the fact that the Tudor was new, there was not many people in the Air Force actually had flown the Tudor. So they decided to restrict the number of uh, participants or applicants to training command. And uh, there was, uh, they very quickly had us noticed in the brochure there, I think some 83 applicants. And CB and OB Philp, who was the, uh, the commander, actually went around to the stations and flew with all the applicants. And from that, they whittled them down to 14. And again, in that fine brochure that John produced, um, 14 of those were brought to uh, Portage Perry for the final tryouts. Uh, there was, uh, seven positions to be filled, 14 applicants. So in the week or 10 days it was there, uh, seven of them didn't make it. It was very interesting if those of you who knew the difference between a Sabre and, a, and an F-100, seven of the applicants were CF-100 pilots and seven were Sabre pilots and none of the CF-100 pilots made it. And I think it may have been due to the fact that most of the Sabre pilots were used to flying formation, not aerobatics, but a lot of formation and that sort of thing. Uh, CB, once we started in September, and it was up to CB and OB to, uh, to bring the team together in a short seven months because we opened in April at uh, Expo 67. And so from scratch, the only people that had an aerobatic team was CB and Dave Barker, who was the, the solo pilot. So between the two of them, they whipped the, uh, the other seven pilots into, uh, into some semblance of a team. And, uh, and we, we uh, opened Expo in, the, in uh, April of 67. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, my position, I was inside left wing, which in that, in that photo would not be the top guy, but the, the one to immediately to his left with the cockpit uh, mostly hidden. CB 
took us into places. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, one of the comments on on a fine book of Canadian aerobatic uh, teams was, "I wonder where he's going to take us now." We were at somewhere in uh, southeastern BC. CB was pulling us up in one valley and recovering in a roll in another valley. So, and I do believe we uh, we did a, an air show in Preston. He's uh, a, a tremendous uh, a tremendous legacy that he has left Preston, and uh, and I'm glad that uh, the town or that John has uh, spearheaded this, and that that folks like you are behind it, and we get the city behind it because he's uh, both a tremendous legacy and and shows what can happen to uh, somebody from a small town. You don't have to be from a big town to, to do something uh, momentous. Um, it's, if anyone has any questions or if John can add to anything I've said there, there's a picture there is, uh, is of a loop. And, uh, and that was six. And you, you might wonder why there were six and, and nine. And then towards the end, a lot of the pictures will only show eight airplanes. In October, uh, we lost, um, Tom Bed was killed out on a low level training mission and flew into the ground. Nobody knows why. There was no alcohol involved. There was no heart uh, problems. Just flew into the ground. In February of 67, we took the airplane out to Comox, which the snowbirds do now. And uh, we had a collision between uh, number seven and number nine with the result that Dave Barker went into the ground and was killed. There was then no time left to uh, bring somebody else in to bring it back up to nine airplanes. So we went with eight airplanes. The reason with nine was because the Tudor's so small. Uh, if we'd have gone with the original four, like the, like the uh, Golden Hawks, the, it, the footprint across the sky would have just been too small. So with a, with a nine plane footprint, as which the uh, snowbirds use now, you can see that they, they, they're easy to see against the sky. And when they break down into the, the uh, six plane and the three plane, you've still got a fair size footprint up in the air to look at. Anybody have any questions or anything about uh, things CB did or anything about the, the team itself? I'm, I'm just running now, John, uh, the, the letter of December from uh, the United States Air Force Thunderbirds. Yes. Any comments on that? Uh, I, th I think we acquitted ourselves fairly well when we went into the States. I'm, I'm sure the, uh, the Americans, we had good reception from the, the, uh, the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels. But I think when they heard that they were going to be doing some co-shows with these Canadian guys and they're, they're using their trainer airplanes, I'm sure there was a little, not skepticism, but they were interesting how we were going to use a trainer where the Golden Hawks had been a frontline fighter and they were, Americans were using frontline fighters. And one of the shows we did at was a training base in the States, Williams Air Force, maybe in Tucson or something like that. And we had Canadian exchange officers down there and when we taxied in, the Canadian exchange officer, whom I knew, came up and he said, you have no idea what you've done to my standing amongst my peers down here. We came in and we pitched out the nine plane and landed the nine plane or the eight plane. They were allowed to do maximum two ship landings. So, uh, and then, of course, the following day, we went up and did an air show for them. So, um, yes, we were pretty sure the team was going to go the extra year. Um, and the Canadian public was behind us. Um, the military was behind us, uh, submitted it up the, uh, the line and the treasury board said, you can do as you want, but there's no more money. And there had been a million dollars or $2 million or something set aside in 1966, specifically to bring the, the golden centenaires up to speed, but it was only for that year. So, uh, that was the reason they were canceled. And if it had not been for OB Phil, um, the Golden or the uh, the Snowbirds probably wouldn't be in existence. Instead of being promoted and sent to Chatham or to uh, Moose Jaw, had he been promoted and sent to a desk job in Ottawa, the they probably not the, the airplanes would not have been brought out of mothballs and sent to Moose Jaw, and they were the genesis of the Snowbirds as we knew them. The Snowbirds used all the ex centenary airplanes initially. On your screen now is the 
a couple of photographs. John, could you comment on those? Yeah. This, is this is a takeoff, the eight plane takeoff. And although the snowbirds don't use an eight plane, nine plane takeoff or landing, because they, I guess they, years ago, they had an incident and a uh, near accident. It's actually a very simple uh, maneuver to, uh, to accomplish. Um, the, uh, on the takeoff, the lead airplanes get airborne first, followed by the rear airplanes. On landing, the reverse is true. The, the back airplanes touch down and call so, and uh, then the, the lead airplanes can, can touch down. You notice the, ge the gear is all in transition and the flaps would be shortly also. Any comments on these other photographs? Yeah. And the, uh, you, I'm starting to get a tear in my eye. <laughs> Look at those. The, uh, if, I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff the snowbirds have put out with, of course, with these GoPro cameras and everything. We would have killed to have that sort of uh, capability back then. All we've got is some 16 mil, eight mil, and the odd still. Uh, if you've seen some of the snowbird stuff, it's just fantastic. There's there's a picture of CB as I remember, Clarence Bartholomew Lang. Um, as you, you can see, the airplane has got two seats side by each. Um, and depending on which side of the formation you flew on, you flew in that seat. And that was one of the, when we uh, took over the airplanes, they had to spend a, a fair bit of money and install uh, landing gear uh, switches or handles in both sides of the cockpit so you could fly from either side. Um, a CB flew from the right-hand side. I flew from the right-hand side. All the guys on the right side of the airplane, of course, could fly from the left. Another picture uh, during that, the workshops in Yeah, Comox. that's probably, yeah, you know, I was just going to say that's probably Comox because of the, uh, that thing with the donuts on it is the, uh, is the uh, arrestor gear cable. So you had to land over that unless you wanted a tremendous thump on the bottom of the airplane with those donuts, which would bounce. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, we, uh, we started the, uh, oh, there's the, uh, the, the picture in the top left is of the uh, entrance maneuver. The, the aircraft would come in in the, in the nine plane, do a loop, change formation, go into another loop, change formation, go into another loop, and throw the uh, solos off into the blue, and they'd go do their thing. And then it's basic six plane. And from then on in, it was basic uh, six plane, but it became then two plane, until the very end, at which time they uh, we would join up and do what we call the upward downward bomb burst, which is the last maneuver. And uh, we'd, you'd come in with uh, all airplanes, uh, the eight together, the, uh, the lead would pull up into a loop, the first three, the bottom four would continue on, they'd pull into a loop. As they were coming down the backside of their loop, the first three, would be just pulling up into their loop. And uh, at the appropriate time, the top three would split, allowing uh, enough space for the bottom uh, four to go up and, and split. And they had to, uh, they, uh, they had to do this, the split. You try to get it as close as possible. And there were times when I could hear the jet blast of the other aircraft as we went through the hole they had left. So we were down in, uh, after, as, as John mentioned, as uh, in the brochure there, we did 121 uh, uh, air shows in 100 and whatever days it was. And the average air, the, the average team does about 35 air shows a year now. And uh, we were getting it pretty tired. We did 100 in Canada. We actually did a, over 100 because it was Canada's 100th birthday and we were not going to do any more than 100. However, there were air shows where we had a practice crowd of 10,000 people while we did our own, own practice. Uh, we got invited down to the States and, uh, and did another 20, 21 there. And on the taxi back in uh, Nellis Air Force Base, 
that we were uh, after we had landed we were informed that uh, the treasury board had said no so the the air force uh, we got the official word that we would not be continuing for the following year which was kind of a blow because we were all looking forward to it of, of having a rest and maybe only doing about uh, 80 air shows the following year as you can tell in, in uh, this position the there's not much space between the airplanes. And we had actually, when we started out at Comox, we were actually overlapping wings four to six feet. And uh, I think one of the causes of Dave's accident, uh, well, never attributed to that, is that, um, that we had to move out and we moved out to wingtip position. I think on the snowbirds, you'll see them, they actually overlap somewhat. Um, there's, yes, this is of the, our nine plane. <clears throat> and let's say we, uh, we lost Dave out there and we went back to the, or we went to the airplane and uh, continuing the rest of the uh, six, eight months with the eight plane. Probably if you remember, the, the Sabre was probably the perfect airplane for an air show airplane. It had the speed, it had the good looks, and yet it, uh, it was slow enough that it could keep everything within the uh, confines of the, air, of the airport. The problem with the IC with the, uh, the um, American teams is they've got these frontline fighters, they go the speed of heat, but when they come by and pull up into a loop, they go up 10,000 feet. If they do a bomb burst, it takes them 10 minutes to get back over the, the airport again. Tremendous formation pilots and everything, but I I much prefer what the what the snowbirds can do. Is there any more on the brochure that you wish me to share, John or Johnny? No, I think that's about it. I appreciate that, Dave. Does anyone have any questions or any? Yes. Yeah, Dave. We have a dump bunch of questions, and I'll start with Greg Baker. So so these planes are getting quite old. The ones they're using now are getting quite old. How much longer can they keep flying those ones? Uh, uh, Greg, there's, there's quite, a, quite a discussion going on on Facebook if you follow that. Uh, there's people that think they should have been retired a long time ago. Given that they, I doubt that they'd fly 300 hours a year, and I don't know how many of you own your own airplanes, but uh, there's workhorses out there uh, in Civvy Street that are going 30,000 hours. These, as long as they've got the parts and the spare parts are all the aircraft that they've got in the, in the hangars and places, places like Mountain View. Um, th these things, I guess, are instrumented up with strain gauges and all sorts of things. So they're really looking at them closely. I've heard they'll go for till the end of the decade anyway. I would, I would quite happily jump back in one and go flying. Uh, it, it wouldn't bother me at all. Casey had a question. Pardon? Unmute. Casey has a question. Unmute, please, Casey. I'm getting as bad as John here trying to unmute things. Oh. Um, as, a, as a young uh, fellow, I was uh, I climbed up onto the uh, top of uh, Christensen's elevator when you guys put your show on here in Creston. Uh, so that was more than impressive. Right. Uh, the question I had was uh, curiosity as to whose idea it was to do a, uh, a, uh, uh, an eight plane landing in formation. Um, that's a good question. And I don't know whether it was the, the Hawks used to do with the four or the six plane. And I think it was just, it was just a given. I think we were gonna do it. Although there, there may have been discussion over an open bottle of something stronger than soda pop. <laughs> that, uh, a, a, an interesting thing, uh, the, uh, because we had, we had a different airplane, it was slower, it didn't have the power that the, uh, the Sabre had. We knew, or the CB and Dave Barker knew that some of the maneuvers would not go. So uh, both CB, Dave Barker, and OB Phillips spent many a night under CB's kitchen table with pieces of paper and bottles of something or other libations working out what this, uh, all those maneuvers were, were done in CB Lang's uh, kitchen in his, in his married quarter in Portage Prairie, which is only about four houses down from me. 
Any other questions? Well, John, tell, tell us a little bit about CB as you knew him. Well, I did not, uh, although CB and I flew Sabres, he was about two years ahead of me. So I never really crossed paths with him in, in over in Europe. And my first meeting with him, of course, was, uh, was when we were doing the, uh, the uh, workups, the selections and the trials. But as uh, if any of you knew him, John knew him, tremendous fellow, very easy to get along with. Uh, got things done not by demanding that you do them, but more like asking you to do them. Yes, he was a rank ahead of me. Yes, I called him sir, but it was still we were still friends both at work and uh, and outside of work. He lived about uh, three or four houses down my, from me in Port Superior, and what we call the the married quarters. And uh, uh, well, an interesting uh, interesting. Uh, little anecdote as you know one of the things cb had to get done before the uh the team went on the road was get married to ann and uh cb had a i think a gallbladder problem or something which came to light and they said you're grounded until you get that figured because uh if i guess if you decide to pass a gallstone or kidney stones i guess what it can incapacitate you you can't you can't do anything so he had to have this operation so he did the operation and it was just a, a few days or weeks before he and Annie got married. And I flew him down from Port Superior down to Sydney to get married uh, in a beach 18. Now he had his wheelchair with, with him, which he really didn't need, but we thought that would be a good, uh, good thing for him to be wheeled out of the airplane, this beach craft, which is a, which is a small transport aircraft. In, in case Annie was going to be there, which she was. So we land at Sydney, get out, of the, get out of the airplane, open up the wheelchair, CB gets into it, and we push him into the, into the terminal. Now, it's one of those things, once you've started this ball rolling, you can't unroll it. So there's Annie there, and he decides not to tell her. So that night or the next night is the, uh, is the practice for the, the wedding. And we show up at the church with him in the in the wheelchair, wheel him into the church. Annie's there. The priest is there. The best man is there. And the priest looks at CB and he looks at Annie. So they go through the little practice. And you've all done these little practices. And at the break, the priest comes up to the best man and he says, um, Mr. Lang there, uh, is he, uh, is everything okay? And the best man says, yeah why do you ask he says well you know that the the church puts great store in, in children and family and everything is, <laughs> is mr lang going to be able to well you know perform <laughs> so it was the priest was assured that yes he was fine and things would be okay they kept annie in the dark till uh, the morning she didn't know whether he was going to walk down the aisle or be wheeled down the aisle so anyway, if, if any of you knew CB before he left the military, I don't think that sense of humor uh, was, uh, he, he picked that up in the military. He had that right from the get-go. Johnny and John, thank you. I, we have a couple minutes more. Uh, Johnny, can you just, uh, I'm, most people are aware of your, uh, your goal, your dream, your passion about bringing uh, this uh, to Creston. Can you, in just a couple minutes, um, I'll give you a couple more minutes to, uh, to wrap up. Just tell us what your goal is and how you see this unfolding and what we as a club or as individuals can do to support you. Well, this has been a long journey. It started about 12 years ago when Don Lieben was here and he and I are good friends. And we got talking and one thing led to another and we decided we should try and get a tutor and honor Clarence because most people don't realize what he did. Anyway, I started with Jim Abbott and we tried to get one from the Air Force. He even had some conversations with Peter McKay, but nothing worked. And I just about given up on it when I found a thing on the internet, tutors for sale. And a fellow in Ontario named David Carlisle had actually bought 10 surplus tutors. So I called him up and negotiated a deal and we bought one of the tutors. And uh, 
but it was a long drawn out thing and what were we gonna do, how we're we gonna paint it. Anyway, at the end of the day, he's he did the one that's in Fort McMurray and he's got the engineered drawings of it. He's an interesting guy. He's done a lot of things. But anyway, we now have the Tudor in Ontario. It's completely painted and ready to mount, stripped of everything. And it's ready to load on a truck and bring here and put up. And I've talked to the town and we're trying to figure out where to put it. I want to put it between the flag and the visitor center and then maybe have a rolling display in there in our history wall about Clarence. And they've got it with their planning department. Hopefully it'll go there. There's no guarantees, but that's what I'd like. And any help I can get, I'll ask for when I need it. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions for, for Johnny on this next phase of the Golden Centenaires and C.B. Lang and Creston? If not, Johnny and John. Okay, oh, David, there's one other thing. Sure, Johnny. If we could have, I didn't go to the town soon enough, but if we could have headed up by August the 4th, the snowbirds were going to come and fly over our dedication. And we can only do that when they're in the area, but I'm pretty sure, I haven't talked to them, but if we do this next summer when they're in the area, the actual dedication, they will come and fly over because they still have that kind of respect for CB Lang. Um, thank you. I, that would be absolutely fabulous. Uh, I think you've got a couple little hurdles to jump before you get there, uh, but I know that your passion for this, and uh, I, I can just tell in, in John's voice this morning, uh, when he looks at the pictures, he had a little, um, a little gulp in his throat, and uh, there's a lot of passion, there's a lot of history here. Um, thank you very much, both of you, for uh, sharing this with us this morning, uh, coming all the way from Vernon, John. Um, welcome, uh, best to you and to, to Johnny. We uh, will see where this goes and how much we can support you. And again, one more time, John, congratulations on a well-deserved honor this last week. I'm quite confident that your face is gonna be on the front page of the newspaper on Thursday. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that. Um, you know how I love that. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Nice talking to you this morning. Thank Thanks you very, very much, much, John, for doing this. Thank you for that program. Uh, all the best. Thank you very much. What a great history. You know, I, I think it's something that we, maybe as a club, need to talk about and, and support John in this. It uh, looks like a, a great opportunity. I'm going to stop recording now. Um, because